Welcome to If You Love This Planet. I'm Dr. Helen Caldicott, and in this program we talk about the greatest medical and environmental threats to all life, such as nuclear weapons and nuclear power, global warming, ozone depletion, toxic pollution, deforestation, and many other social and political issues that relate to global well-being. So if you love this planet, keep listening. Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today again is Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, a company which provides research, analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues. Arnie is an independent nuclear engineering and safety expert who provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the US, Canada, and internationally. He's been a leading voice globally about the impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and he joins us now again. Arnie, welcome. Hi, Helen. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Arnie, I know you're a regular contributor to the to this program, but you're a very important voice, uh, and people... <laughs> really follow you very closely on Fukushima because you're one of the few people that people can trust and know that you're giving legitimate data. So that's why I keep inviting you back, number one, and number two, because the accident isn't finished. So, Arnie, first, before we go into other details, what about giving us um, an update um, on what's happening in Fukushima at the reactors and also the Daini reactor south of Fukushima too. Okay. Well, if you um, if, if the role is I, I I have to keep on your show until the accident is over, I think we'll both be dead by then. So uh, it's, <laughs> it's going to be a long time before like the accident. Like thirty is or over. forty years, I'll be a hundred and twenty. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to answer your question, um, you know, here it is the uh, uh, the the middle of the winter, and the uh, it, it's been. You know, quite cold, about uh, seven below Celsius, which is seventeen Fahrenheit. Um, and um, in the last three days, there's been about eighteen pipes that have sprung leaks. Really? Because they're cold. Oh. Um, you know, the, these pipes were thrown down in a hurry, and they didn't have time to insulate them. And um, so now we're having uh, pipe leaks, and the spent fuel pool cooling system on Unit Four had to be. Uh, uh, shut down for a couple hours while they fix the pipe leaks and things like that. Now, they're going to insulate the pipes to prevent them from freezing, and the insulation will be in by the spring. So that's a, a little bit late, but, uh, you know, over the years, it, it, it will uh, the, the pipes will finally be insulated. The, the leaks were um, um, in numerous systems, and um, and they were radioactive uh, onto the ground, um, I don't know that they've gone directly into the ocean, but they're they're onto the ground. So that's a that's the most recent physical thing. But uh, there's a couple other things that have come out. One was a uh, a scientific study that says that when you add salt water to hot nuclear fuel, you change the uranium chemically. It's still uranium. It's still radioactive, but you change it chemically, and it makes it much more soluble in water which is not a good thing. Uh, now, of course, we all know that the molten core was cooled with seawater, and these uh, these scientists who wrote it are, are very concerned that now we've got <clears throat> uranium in a form that will stay dissolved in seawater for, for decades, if not centuries, because it, it's um, chemically such that it won't, it won't play it out. So, uh, you know, that's a concern also. The, um, there's a lot of construction activity on Unit 4, uh, taking down the walls and, uh, and, and things like that, um, and, um, uh, because they're structurally not sound. And that's still, you know, my, my big concern still remains that uh, if there's a significant earthquake, and uh, significant means like 775, um, 
that that building can still collapse. Now, a prominent scientist just came out and said there's a 70% chance of an earthquake of that magnitude this year. Oh. And there's a 98% chance of an earthquake of that magnitude in the next three years. So, you know, that uh, that Unit 4 is, um, is critical to get uh, uh, shored up and resolved because there's no containment whatsoever around the... Um, uh, around the nuclear fuel. And and finally, the other two units, um, Unit 2, they drilled a hole in the side of the containment and sent a little camera in. And um, you really don't see much, but it's high, high humidity, which you'd expect because the nuclear core is not inside the nuclear reactor. It's on the floor. So all of that heat is creating steam, and um, it looked like a, sort of a scene from the movie Alien. Everything was kind of dripping and oozing. Um, and Unit 3 is still off, off balance to anybody. There's no, uh, there doesn't appear to be any, any significant efforts in it. Still water in the, uh, um, uh, on site, still, um, still leaks. Um, my concern there is the, is the leakage into the groundwater. And, um, and, of course, that, once it's in the groundwater, it's not coming out for hundreds of years. So, you know, it's, it's precariously stable. Uh, and I talk about that in our, the video we put out at the, right at the turn of the year, um, where uh, as long as nothing really bad happens, it'll, it'll hang together. But, uh, um, you know, something like an, another earthquake or a, a hydrogen explosion inside of one of the containments, uh, could could pop all this up to the surface again, and, and lastly, there was a um, uh, an earthquake right at the uh, right at January first. It wasn't huge; it was better than a six, so it's certainly very significant. But all at once afterward, the cesium concentrations went up pretty much all over all over Japan, and what they figure now is that a lot of that stuff that's lying on the ground. Got shaken up as mm. dust and and re and re volatilized again, and uh, of course that concern is going to be with us for uh, uh, for years to come. Now, uh, Ani, um, TEPCO and the Japanese government say they have cold shutdown. Can you explain to the audience in the three molten reactors why that is not so, and what yeah, what cold is shutdown. cold shutdown? Cold shutdown in the nuclear industry means that. The uh, nuclear core is below boiling, uh, you know, 200 Fahrenheit, about you know, 90, 95 uh, Celsius. But it also means that the nuclear core is actually inside the nuclear reactor, um, and that means that all of the nuclear fuel is quite cool. Even the center of the co- uh, the fuel is quite cool. Remember, the pool, the fuel is about the thickness of a pinky, and if the outside's at at 90, you know, Celsius, the inside's not going to be too hot. But what's happened at Fukushima is that, one, there's no nuclear core in the nuclear reactor. It's all melted down and is on the floor. So the center of that molten mass is much hotter than, than 212. Um, so it, it really is a misnomer to call it a, a, a cold shutdown um, because it's not a closed system. There's a hole in the bottom of it and the water's leaking out. Um, it's, uh, it's important that they were able to cool the water. But it, it certainly doesn't represent the stability that the term cold shutdown really means. In a normally designed, functioning reactor with all its rods in place and the control rods in place and the water circulating, it's just a big molten blob of radioactive lava, isn't it? So to say it's a cold shutdown is crazy. Right. Yeah. And that blob is covered with water. Yeah. So the outside of the blob is at you know, 200 or 300 degrees, but the inside of that blob is still molten and will be for years because all that decay heat from all those fissions over the years is, is going to keep that blob hot. So what would be the temperature inside the blob then? Um, you know, we're at the point where there's really no science to, no. to make that determination. But my guess is something around 1,000 degrees. Oh, really? And now, that's, that's not molten. You know, for, 
for uranium, it has to be about 2,000 to be molten. Mm. But 1,000 degrees is, you know, certainly hot enough to fry an egg. That ain't a cold shutdown. That ain't a cold shutdown. Now, Annie, the main reason I wanted to interview you were, well, there several things. I wanted to talk about the cedar flowers and I wanted to talk about the grasshoppers. Do you want to talk about that? those issues? <clears throat> yeah, the, the cedar flowers are a major concern. Um, most of Japan's um, uh, mountains are, are um, have cedar trees planted on them. And uh, they've discovered that the, um, the, t- the tips of these new, the new buds, and of course it's winter there, so in the spring the cedar flowers will, will release their pollen. But the tips of those buds not only have pollen in it, but they're, they're loaded with cesium to the tune of about um, a quarter of a million disintegrations per second for every kilogram of, of, of buds that are, that are out there. So the, the, um, the analysis shows that um, these, these cedar trees will you know, uh, uh, open up in the spring and release their, uh, their pollen. These are the male buds, not the female buds. They'll release their pollen, and they'll release cesium. Um, and um, it, it, there's lots of assumptions in the calculation, and, and none of them are, very, um, uh, are, are concerned about protecting the population. But the calculations show that the uh, people exposed will be getting about 10 times what, um, what people in Tokyo will be getting. Frankly, I wouldn't surprise me if the people in Fukushima Prefecture get a hundred times background mm. uh, for a period of a couple months, while all these um, these cedar buds are uh, are spewing forth the uh, the cesium. The the concern is twofold. One is the obviously the inhalation exposure, and and, and the second is now you've revolatilized cesium, so where you think it's clean, it's going to be dirty again, and they're going to have to go back in and and decontaminate areas because of cesium deposition. So the trees are sucking up through their roots cesium that's dissolved in the water um, and go, and, and then it's, it's bioconcentrating in the pollen in the buds, right? That's absolutely right. And that's not going to stop this year. You know, the same cycle is going to happen next year well, in the cesium, year after. Cesium lasts for 600 years, or some say right. 300, but, you know, 300 to 600. We're talking about time frames that one can hardly imagine. What's the geographical distribution, Arnie Gunderson, of the cesium-laden trees? Well, I know that 70% of Fukushima Prefecture is forest. Mm. Um, and... Um, uh, to give your uh, your listeners an idea, Fukushima Prefecture is roughly the size of the state of Connecticut. Uh, so it, it's uh, you know in the states here, it's a not a not a large state, but it's a it's still you know thousands of square kilometers is is contaminated. So the uh, um, the the Japanese are planning over time to take. Uh, five centimeters of soil off of everything, off of the entire prefecture, and um, um, to to prevent the further spread of cesium. But that won't stop the trees sucking it up from the uh, underground water system. No, you're absolutely right, Helen. And where? And where? Go on. Once the trees suck it up, it's going to be on top again because it's going to come out with the with the buds. And where are they going to put this six centimeters of soil? I ask you. Uh, well, that's you know that's, that's really radioactive important. waste. Yeah, that's really important because they are not treating it as radioactive waste. What? What the rule is in Japan is um, they are incinerating anything radioactive as long as the ash stays below four thousand disintegrations per second in a kilogram of material. Now, what they do to uh, to uh, meet that goal is let's say you've got something highly, highly contaminated. What they do to meet that goal is they take a whole bunch of clean material and burn the clean material so that the concentration at the end stays below this 4,000. Rather than treat it as radioactive waste and keep it in concentrated form, 
they are in fact creating a hundred to a thousand times more radioactive material in an effort to drop the concentration down. 